So this morning, we are going to be in probably our last week in the book of Acts, uh, the first seven chapters. Now, the book of Acts, in case you're new to this, uh, the first seven chapters, they cover how the Holy Spirit moved in the early church in Jerusalem to spread the gospel powerfully through men and women that, other, that most people would probably not give a second glance to. God worked mightily. And we met one of these men over the last couple weeks. His name was Stephen. And you remember, we, Stephen was originally introduced to us because he was chosen to work with other men to help distribute to needy widows who could not provide for themselves food and money. But the ministry of Stephen did not stop there. Luke goes on to say, the guy who wrote Acts, he goes on to say how Stephen performed great wonders and signs among the people. And so Stephen became a prominent witness to the gospel. The problem for Stephen is that he caught the attention of some of the religious leaders who did not really care for the impact that he was making because they didn't believe that Jesus was the Savior. And so they, they, they trumped up false charges against him, made false accusations. They had him arrested, and then he stood trial in front of the Sanhedrin, which was kind of like the, the Jewish court of that time. And the high priest said to him, I said, all these accusations, is this so? And so, and then he went on a whole 50 verse sermon about how blind they were to who the Savior was. And he, and he actually ends up saying, he says in the end, you stiff necked people, how can you be so blind? And that brings us today to verse 54, where we're going to see how the religious leaders responded. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious, and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, and he saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see heaven open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city, and they began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, who eventually we know as Paul, the apostle. We'll get to that later. Now, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is the word of, word of, the, word of the Lord, if I can get it out. When I read about Stephen, I think, man, what an incredible Christian he must be. I mean, he was a legit follower of Jesus Christ. He was a name brand Christian. He wasn't like a knockoff brand Christian. You know, like you go to ShopRite and you see like there's Nabisco cookies, you know, like vanilla wafers and stuff like that. And then they have like the knockoff cheap brand. No, no, he was like the Nabisco brand of Christian. Yeah. He was. He was legit. He was varsity Christian. He was first string Christian, man. He was the real deal. I mean, this good guy stood here with such great faith as he was about to die. And let's not gloss over what was about to happen. Man, it dragged them out of the city, out into the desert. They grabbed any stone or rock they could find, and they were going to start hurling as many rocks and stones at him until he was dead. Now, I've never been stoned yet, but i got to tell you, that, that's got to be a horrible way to die. Can you even imagine what a horrible way to die? And yet, Stephen seemed to have this faith, this peace to the point that he actually asked God to forgive them. He said, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. I mean, other than Jesus Christ, who does that? I mean, who does that? I mean, most of the time, I, I think, you know, all things being equal, when someone does us dirty, we enjoy, we relish the thought of how we want to get even with them. We think about what they deserve for hurting us. I mean, think about the last time you're driving around the road and somebody cuts you off. Did you suddenly go, Lord, please do not hold their sin against them? 
Mm -mm, it's not what you did. You know what you did. Sorry, the Lord forgives you for it. Serious though, how can Stephen have this kind of reaction to his suffering? How is this possible? And this is a good question for us to ask because we've said this many times, every one of us will face suffering. We will face trials. We will face problems, either by our own design or by somebody else's. And how we respond to them reveals who Christ is in our lives. So it's important we understand how he could respond. And let me tell you why he could respond this way. In a way most of us probably could never imagine responding. Stephen had a good answer for suffering. He had a good answer for suffering. Let me explain to you what I mean. There was a book that was written I think, 20 years ago by a secular dude, and it was called The Real American Dream. And in this book, the guy was saying that in every culture, every culture tells their people what they should live for and what their meaning should be. If you look in American history, in the 18th century, you were told God is your meaning. He is your meaning in life. He is your goal. He is what you are looking after. In the 19th century, American culture was, was like you should be living for your nation, right? For your family, for your communities. And then in the 20th and the 21st century, it, it changed to your meaning being found in, in your own life and having personal freedom, freedoms to live as you want to live, free from the influence of, of family uh, and community. And isn't this so true? I mean, right now, we are all about self-expression. We are taught to, to, to be who we want to be, to live how we want to live, to do what we want to do. And, and nobody has the right to tell you otherwise. Nobody. Nobody. And the point that he was making in all of this is that depending on where you place meaning in your life, it's going to determine how you respond to suffering. This is why Stephen could respond the way he did. This, this is good. I want you to listen. This is important for all of you. Do you realize that if the meaning of life, your meaning is in the kingdom of God, and in the glory of God, that when you face suffering, that when you face a death, as hard as it is, as painful as it is, it can never touch your meaning. Because your meaning in God is bigger. It's longer. It's more powerful. It's longer lasting. It can't be touched. It can touch you, but it can't touch your meaning. You see, Stephen was living for God. So there was nothing that these guys could do that, were gonna, that was going to touch his meaning. They couldn't take that away. They could take his life, but they couldn't take his meaning. On the flip side, if you're not living for God, you're living basically just to be free. You want to live as you want to live. You want to pursue what's important to you. You want to craft your own life, your own identity. You want to decide what is right, and you want to decide what is wrong. Even if you don't consciously make these decisions, this is what you're pursuing. It's what everybody pursues. The basic highest and most important thing in your life is your own personal choice and your own personal freedom. The problem is, is when your meaning is in yourself, suffering can get to you. And when that suffering comes and it takes away where everything you put your meaning in, it, it, dec it decimates you. It melts you down. It takes away your strength. You, you don't have ability to face the suffering. You don't have any hope. All you can do is fight it or run and try to avoid it. In fact, I met an athlete on a plane once. He was a former NFL player. And he said, my whole life, I was training to be in the NFL. From the youngest time, my kids had me in coaches and extra camps because I was really good. I lived, I breathed, I ate the NFL. And he goes, then I got injured. And like that, he said, it was all taken away. And he goes, I went into the darkest, deepest hole because my identity, my meaning, everything was gone. Why? Why? Because his suffering was bigger than his meaning. 
St. Augustine, he says that life is basically about ordering your loves properly. He says, we all love things, but do we order them properly? What gets your highest love? What do you see as your highest worth and your highest value? He said, our problems in life come from the fact when our loves are disordered, when our meanings are disordered, when our values are disordered. In fact, somebody once summarized his his whole topic on this, and they said this, that only love of the immutable can bring tranquility, to bring peace. Why? Because as we said, if, if your highest love, if the thing that you love the most in life is something that can never be taken from you, then you can face life with peace. Doesn't make it easy, doesn't make it fun, doesn't make it hard, it it doesn't mean it's not painful, but your meaning can never be taken from you. Listen, hear me on this. If you sit here today and you are filled with fear, if you are filled with anxiety, if you are filled with sadness and hopelessness in a situation, if you're feeling crushed, I promise you it is partly because you're setting your heart on things that suffering can take away from you. You're setting your heart on meaning that suffering can take away. You have your loves out of, out of priority. They're out of, it's out of whack. You have to find peace in this world. In every situation, you have to set your heart on the one thing that suffering cannot destroy. And then you will be able to handle suffering. Just like Stephen. Now I want to show you how he got here. Because ordering your loves, having the right meaning in your life, it doesn't just happen automatically. You don't just open your mail one day and it pops out. Ah, it doesn't work like that. There is something that separates those who order their loves and their meaning correctly and those who don't. Right here. Go back to 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What's Stephen doing here? He's looking to Jesus. In this moment, he's looking to Jesus. His eyes are on God. They're not on what's going on around him. They're not looking at the rocks and the boulders that are about to be hurled at his face and his body. They were on his Savior. This is where his faith was. This is where his trust was. This is where his confidence was. Now listen, I I don't think Stephen was superhuman. He was human like us. So I guarantee you there was fear. He saw those rocks. He knew what it was going to be like. I'm sure there was pain. But amongst all of that, his focus was on the Lord. And this is how we order our loves in such a way that we are able to see beyond our circumstances, that we are not crushed when suffering comes. We look to Jesus. We look to to Jesus. This is the difference right here. See, the mistake that many of us make, even myself, is during our trials, we are never looking up. We're never looking up. We're looking at the problem. We're worrying about the problem. We're thinking about how all the problems will become worse. And then that's how those can become worse. And we play it over and our over, and we're just staring at it with our souls and the anxiety and the tension and everything is building up. Y'all know what I'm talking about because y'all been there. We're not looking up. What's causing you fear right now? What's causing you anxiety right now? What's causing you to feel crushed and tense right now? Are you looking up? Are you looking up? See, what happens is when you look up, it changes your perspective. Let me tell you what I mean here. 
Tim Keller talked about this once in one of his books that he wrote. He says, in this moment, Stephen was in an earthly courtroom. He was in an earthly courtroom that was going to decide to end his life painfully. But as he stood in that earthly courtroom, he saw the heavenly courtroom. As he looked up to Jesus, he saw the heavenly courtroom in the sky. He saw Jesus seated at the right hand of God. The man he saw on the cross, the man he saw heal, the man he saw teach, he's now seen him at the right hand of God. Do you know what that means for Stephen? It means that Jesus, wait, 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 Jesus is there, so he got victory over death. It meant that Jesus paid the price for sin as he said he would, and it, but it also means he didn't stay dead, that he rose from the grave. And if he died for my sins and he rose from the grave, then that means the work of salvation is done. And if he's up there, that means the work of Jesus is done. And it means there's nothing that else needs to be done. Then, and if there's nothing else that needs to be done, that means there's nothing else that can defeat it. See, when we look around ourselves and we look at the things that are going on in our life, it's so easy for us to see defeat. But when we look to Jesus, we see victory. When you look to Jesus, you see the victory, the victory that he earned. He's not here anymore. He won the battle. He won the war. You know what that meant for Stephen? That nothing that was done in this earthly courtroom could touch what was happening in that heavenly courtroom. Stephen may have been condemned to death, He may lose his life, but he knew that when he died because of the work of Christ, when he opened his eyes, he would see his Savior in the heavenly courtroom. And this is why every Christian, and I don't mean Christian people who go to church on Christmas and Easter. I mean Christians who have literally put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Why every follower of Christ should be able to endure any suffering or any struggle. Because through the pain and through the suffering, through the trials, through the trouble, they are able to look up to their Savior. To look past their light and momentary troubles to an eternal glory that God has prepared that outweighs them all. 2 Corinthians. Where are you looking this morning? Where are you looking in your trials, in your trouble, in your sin that's caused you so much trouble, where are you looking? Are you looking at them? Or are you looking at Jesus? Those of you struggling in your marriages, oh, there's a lot of marriages that are struggling right now. Are you looking at the brokenness of your marriage or are you looking to Jesus, the healer of marriages? Those of you in financial trouble, are you looking at your financial struggles? Or are you looking to Jesus who provides for every need? For those of you struggling with having self-worth and feeling like you can be used by God, are you looking at what the world tells you? Are you looking at what other people have told you? Are you looking at what Jesus says about who you are because of his death and resurrection? Where are you looking? Now, if you're like me, some of you might be asking, how do I do this? I want to do this. I I want to look up. I want to look to Jesus. I just don't know how. I'll say it again. Stephen was not born some super Christian. He wasn't like on the, the baby assembly line, and God was like, hey, let's just give this guy an extra dose of faith for just fun. He had faith. In fact, it says he was a man of great faith. But that faith wasn't just given to him the moment he popped out of his mama's belly. Now, what is faith? Hebrews 11.1, 1, the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not, anybody? Not seen, right? Sometimes we think faith because we hear these prosperity preachers and their prosperity trash. We think faith is, is, is getting us what we want. If we have enough faith, God will get us what we want. I'm telling you right now, if Stephen had more faith, it's not like he could have got out of this difficulty. It doesn't mean he didn't have enough faith, because let me tell you right now, he's a man of full of faith. Scripture tells us. 
Faith is not about believing in what you want. But faith is about believing in what God has promised you. Faith is believing in God's unfulfilled promises. Faith is believing in God's unfulfilled promises. God says, I'm going to do this, but you're not there yet. But to be able to look at it and say, God said he's going to do that, I'm trusting for that. That's where my confidence is. That's where my faith is. That's what Stephen did in that moment. When he's on his knees looking to heaven. He, had, he wasn't in heaven yet. He wasn't there. He was still breathing. But he had a vision of it. He had faith that that's where he's going to be. That's what gave him the peace. He remembered the words of Jesus that said in John 3, those who are born again, those who start a new life in Christ will see the kingdom of heaven. And let me tell you what faith is. Faith is not just blind faith, right? It's not just blind, utter faith because it makes you feel good. If you think about it, and we often forget about this, our faith is often built on the promises of God that he's already fulfilled. I'll tell you what I mean. Stephen did not yet possess the promise of the kingdom of God, the promise of eternity with him. But I'll tell you what he did possess. He possessed what God had already given him. God had given him the ability to serve the widows. God had given him the ability to perform miracles. God had given him the ability to speak with great power and wisdom that no one could match. Those were the fulfilled promises of God. And it's often in our lives, when we look back to the fulfilled promises of God, that we're like, if I can believe God here, I can believe him here. You see, faith is something that that we, we display in our present moment as we look to the future of God's promises while we're standing firm on the faithfulness of God in the past. In other words, Stephen could be confident Because he can look back to God's faithfulness. And if God's been faithful all this time, I know he's going to be faithful with what he's promised in the future. Where is your faith this morning? Where is your faith? Where is your faith? Is your faith dependent on things that you want but he didn't promise? Is your faith dependent on things that he promised they're not yet there so you're just quite not sure if you're going to be the one exception to his biblical commands? Or is your faith built on like, man, look at all the times I messed up, all the times I sinned, all the times I ignored him, all the times problems happened in my life, and yet I'm still standing. God's been patient. He's been with me. He's not given up on me. Where is your faith this morning? Where's your faith? Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never what? Ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Where's your faith? Now, one problem with this is that far too many of us have no idea what God has promised. Our knowledge of God's promises are are built up by cute mugs that we buy or posters that we buy or t-shirts with fun Christian sayings. That's our theology. We don't know what he's promised. And because we don't know what he's promised, and because we're so focused on what we want him to do, our faith is completely misplaced. Now, one might say, well, it was easy for Stephen to have faith. He had a vision. God, you give me a vision, and I will be a person of great faith. I will dance in faith. I will proclaim your name. Open the heavens. Now, the sarcastic side of me which you all know is a spiritual gift of mine, would say is that most of us, we're not willing to live this kind of bold life that we would ever end up in a situation where we would need a vision like that. We just sit in our our Christian recliner chair getting fat on the word of God, 
expecting the Lord to deliver more miracles and mercies when we don't even need them. But that's another sermon. But if you set that aside, if you read Stephen's sermon last week, the 50 verses, you will see that he was a man of great faith before this vision ever happened. And so it wasn't built on a vision. If you go back and read his sermon, what does he do? He's given him a proper understanding of Jesus, a proper understanding of the Testament and of the Old Testament laws. See, he understood Scripture. He understood the Bible, what would have been his Bible at the time, which was the Old Testament. He understood the words of Jesus, and it colored everything else he saw. That's where his faith came from, understanding the word of God. And he took it with him into every situation. You remember Kevin, he preached here, he brought up all of his bags. And he says, what do you carry with you? Stephen carried the word of God into that situation. Imagine what, how the situation would have been different if he did not carry the word of God. If he did not have a proper understanding of Jesus, if he believed like the people in that time, that some people still believe this way now, maybe some in this room, that I gotta be good enough for God. I gotta obey enough of his laws. If, if, if I can just outweigh the bad with the good, then he'll accept me. Imagine if that was what his faith was built on. Do you think you've been able to stare death in the faith with such confidence? No, he'd be like, oh, was I good enough? Did I do enough? I sinned this morning. Is that it for me? He might have begged for his life because he needed more time to get right with God. Scripture is what fuels your faith, your anger, your fear, your anxiety, your sadness, your hopelessness, your need for control, your, your identity. Scripture tells you who God is among all of those things. He tells you, uh, the Scripture tells you who you are among all those things and then what God is doing and what God has promised and what he's calling you to be. He tells you how to look for Jesus in those situations and how to respond. This is why we are constantly saying over and over again, you got to read your Bible. you got to read it, not like a newspaper. you got to read it and say, what does the Lord say to me? This is why you say you got to memorize scripture so you can take it with you. This is why we're constantly saying, man, we got these great men's studies, these great women's studies. You got to be there. This is why we're saying on a Sunday morning, you shouldn't be anywhere else on a regular basis because it fuels your faith. It prepares you for when the times of crisis will come that you will be able to stand tall in the understanding of God's promises. If you don't prepare yourself in those times outside of God's grace and mercy, you will crumble. And I watch it happen. It prepares you. It reminds you to look to him, to have confidence in him, to know that you are weak without him, but he's going to give you the strength and power to get through things. So what does it say about Stephen? He was full of faith. It also says he was full of the Holy Spirit. We did a whole series on the Holy Spirit. Stephen knew whatever situation I go into, God will be with me. He'll give me the power. Jesus told his followers in Luke 12, he says this. He says, do not become anxious about how or what you should speak in your defense when not being under persecution, or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Stephen said, I can boldly proclaim Christ because I know the power of God. I know the, the, my meaning, my source of life, my promises that are greater than all of my suffering, that are longer lasting. They will be with me. So no matter how weak and how frail and how messed up and how sinful I am does not matter. God overrides them all. In fact, the more sinful I am, the more messed up I am, the more broken I am, the more that God shines through me. When people go, whoa, how did that come out of her? Did her? How did he turn that around? I would not have seen that coming. They are way too messed up for that. And, then, and they come and they ask you, and you can say, Jesus, Jesus. And because your love is higher, your meaning is higher than your suffering, you will walk into those situations. And the fear of what's going to happen will not be priority on your mind. Obedience to God will. 
Because sometimes those consequences that God will put us through, he'll say, hey, go do this, and you're going to suffer for it. Well, what? I'm supposed to follow you and be blessed. No, that is not the Christian life. Sometimes, not as much as I would like, but sometimes. But many times he calls us, and there's going to be bad things that have come out of us. But you can walk confidently because of what your love and your meaning is higher. Look what happened. Look what happened. He, gets, he, he falls asleep. What a great way to, to express someone dying and going to the Lord. And here's what happens next. We're going to 8-1. It says, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Who eventually, most of them, if not all of them, died at the hands of persecution. So this thing's like a bad thing, right? Like, right, this seems bad. There is persecution. They are scattered. Like, this is not a good thing. A great Christian dies. They're persecuted. They can't support each other. And, and it is a bad thing. If you were to stop reading the book of Acts and you never came back to it, which we will, that's how you would feel. But if you kept reading on, you will see because the Christians were persecuted, because they were scattered, they started spreading the gospel throughout the corners of the earth, unlike ever before. So because of his death, because of the persecution, more people were going to find the hope and love and grace and truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me pose a question to you. If God can take the death of an incredible uber-Christian, if he can take the persecution of the Christian church, if he can take all of the Christians who had to run for their lives and bring salvation to the corners of the earth, then what failures, what problems, what sin, what struggles, what trials do you possibly have that God cannot use for his glory? The answer is none. Even if he doesn't save you from your trials, even if he does not save you from the consequences of your sin, even if he does not save you from your suffering, I tell you, if your eyes are set on him, if you are obedient and bold in his word, if your love of him is higher than all the other meanings of your life, God will have glory brought to his name. As the power of the Holy Spirit works through And this perspective should help us all be faithful no matter what's going on. Galatians 6, 9, that if we do not become weary, tired of doing good, being obedient to God in all things at the proper time, the proper time, God's time, not our time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You know what that harvest is? people coming to the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine one day walking in heaven and somebody coming up to you? I don't know if it works like this. I hope it works like this. And saying, you remember that horrible pain you went through? You remember that horrible struggle you went through? I remember how you handled it. I saw it, and it helped me find Jesus. Oh, may we live in such a way that we're creating those kinds of moments with our eyes set on God, with our trust in his word, fueled by faith and the knowledge of his Holy Spirit. Now, he'll use all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Amen, church? Amen. Amen.